Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Victoria Romero. She's a researcher, consultant, and sought after speaker in the areas of neuroscience and human behavior. Victoria is the chief behavioral scientist for CACI, where she focuses on using both social and data science to better understand information transfer and social influence. Victoria, it is awesome to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for taking time with me. Thank you for having me. Victoria, the reason why I wanted to have you on today is to help me and my audience better understand why and how we are persuaded and influenced and what the psychological underpinnings are. And ultimately, I want to answer the question, psychologically, why do we follow someone? That is um, such a complex, but such an important question. There is an entire field of psychology that concentrates on behavior change and influence and persuasion. So asking that question is asking to put an entire degree's worth of information into a podcast. So I'm excited to dive in. So let's talk about it. Awesome. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got into this field. I actually started out as an academic, as a psychology professor. I was a visiting professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles as I was finishing my my PhD in cognitive psychology. And I had intended to be a lab research psychologist, funny enough, studying infant development. So my my PhD degree is actually from an infant development lab studying the development of things like attention and memory um, in the first six months of life. But as I started my career and realized that to be a really good academic, you have to focus very narrowly on a very tight subject. And you may be one of only 10 people in the world <laughs> that knows as much about your, your particular topic. Yeah. It turned out that uh, it just it didn't suit the way I think. I'm more of a lateral thinker. I tend to like to explore too many different subjects and tie them together. In fact, in graduate school, one of my advisors told me I was a, a dilettante, which I think was not meant to be a compliment but I actually kind of took it that way. So I, I just, I came to realize that I was probably not best suited to the very, developing the very, very narrow expertise that so many academics are really, really good at. I think I'm just better suited to making connections and turning research into things that are used in the real world. So in looking around for where else I might apply my psychological um, knowledge, I landed on marketing. So I entered the field of marketing, but I wasn't there very long before I realized that at that time, which was about 2008, there was a growing intersection between marketing and national security. There was Mm. realization that persuasion and influence and what at the time was called the, the war for hearts and minds was as important as building weapons for the battlefield. And national security experts were beginning to reach out to the marketing world. And I happened to be at a marketing firm that they reached out to. And and that's how I started to get involved in that side of the business and learning about the needs within the national security world to understand how humans are persuaded, how they think, how their biases guide their behavior. So the the position I took after that was with a group which was called Archimedes Global, and my position there involved learning about the various audiences around the world and the way that they think. And um, I haven't haven't gone back to the commercial world since. So so I've been at several companies since then, and yeah. every position has been in that in that vein. So at a high level. What psychological components are at play when it comes to persuasion and influence? The psychological components that are important to persuasion and influence, in my opinion, are this the same psychological components that underlie a broad range of human reasoning and emotion. They are used in your you know, when you're when you're thinking and you're being persuaded, those mechanisms are coming into play. But there's nothing special. There's no special persuadability part of the brain, or you know, something along those lines. What one of the most fundamental parts about how people think has to do with categories, developing categories. Mm-hmm. We categorize everything. We don't know that we're doing it all the time, but but we do. 
And it's important to do that because if we didn't, if we had to think of everything we encountered as its own individual entity, that would be overwhelming. We would not be able to process that amount of information on a day-to-day basis. So we think of categories. And so, you know, if you go to the grocery store and you look at that ridiculous cereal aisle with 900 (laughs) boxes of cereal, you can't look at each one and think, do I want that? Or no. So you've got categories. So we may have different categories, but right. you know, in my mind, I might have healthy and unhealthy. And then mm-hmm. under healthy, I might have like taste okay, tastes like a bowl of you know nuts I collected in the yard. And you know, so I may right. and you kind of go down, and it's only when you get to a small enough category that you can actually think of the various elements inside of it that you're you're down to individual entities. But we do that with everything. We do it with people. We do it with ideas. You know, ideas, you look at the American landscape right now, ideas are liberal or they're conservative. You can get a little further down. If they're liberal, they're more like traditional liberal or they're progressive. You know, but we we assign ideas, people, everything to these categories. And once we've done that, we stop seeing all the nuance and the details of the individual ideas and the individual people. And we just kind of assign to them all the qualities of the category that they've been assigned to. And that's a really powerful influence on, on the way that we think and perceive. It, it influences what information we choose to take in. It influences what, what we remember about a piece of information or an idea. We tend to fill in gaps with stuff that fits the category that we assigned it to. We tend to forget the little details that don't fit the category we've assigned it to. And all of this ends up making the category even stronger. It's a self-perpetuating cycle. There's obviously a lot of different things that impact persuasion and influence, but that really core basic way that we think about assigning things to this or that is really powerful. One of the things that I've heard you talk about is this concept of mental shortcuts. Um, What kind of mental shortcuts are typically at work in our everyday thinking? The mental shortcuts, which the the technical term for them would be heuristics, is a really essential part of how we think because we cannot analyze every little decision in our daily life at a high level. We would just, we'd be paralyzed. We'd never get anything done. Um, So human cognition is based on a whole host of these heuristics. If you were to just, you know, do quick Google search on this, you could find lists of them. And some of them are, you know, 20, 30 heuristics long, maybe more. And most of the time, they lead to generally reasonable conclusions, but there are some pretty salient cases um, where they don't. I think one of the ones that's particularly important to attend to these days is the heuristic of availability. And so this is the notion that you think that it, an event, an idea, a type of person is more common based on how often you encounter that kind of event or person. So let, let's just give an example of a car accident. You base your perception on how frequent car accidents are on how often you're exposed to car accidents. So that could be in a news story, it could be a car accident you saw driving down the road, it could be something your friend said to you about a car accident, but you are not basing your understanding of frequency of car accidents on data. I mean, that not to say a person couldn't do that, but that's not really generally what we're doing. Usually we just use this little shortcut of something feels like it happens a lot or it feels really rare based on just how often we think about it. And, you know, in the world before internet and in the world before mass media, that was actually probably a pretty effective way of gauging how likely something was to happen to you because you would encounter things at the same frequency as which they they really happened. But that's not true anymore. Now we encounter news stories of, well, things that didn't happen, you know, first off, (laughs) that's a problem. But even if we're talking about accurate news, accurate news chooses sensational and scary things to tell us. Who considers it news, you know, that I drove to the office without incident, right? (laughs) It's not something that anybody needs to, to hear about. So we hear about scary things and we hear about bad things much more often than they occur, completely out of balance in terms of how often we hear about those things versus 
non-occurrences and, and safe, good outcomes. Yeah. And so yeah. that has the impact of dramatically skewing our, our perception of the likelihood of things. So this impacts things like our concern over something like being the victim of a, of a terrorist attack. Mm-hmm. That's frightening. It's a terrible thought. Extremely unlikely. You were far, far, far more likely to fall in your bathroom and mm-hmm. die from that than you are right. to, to be in a, in a terrorist attack. But nobody walks around fearing that. And, and it just has to do with the fact that you don't see constant news coverage of people falling in their own bathrooms at home. And so um, <laughs> this is, right. you know, so, th- so this really turns our perception of risk on its head and, and makes it hmm. quite difficult when it comes to things that are risky, but are not photogenic in, in a sense. So mm-hmm. something like medical errors is an example I use sometimes. Far more people are injured and, and even die as a result of medical errors than of something like car accidents or certainly terrorist attacks. And I think I think if you look at the stats, even, even gun violence is lower than medical errors. Hmm. And most people don't know that. Most people don't feel fearful. It's just an example of where the amount of emotion and fear we have about something is a result of the discussion around it, the news coverage, not actual data. One of the things that strikes me about what you're saying is that it actually is very helpful when you look at the data. What you just said is that gun violence and car accidents and even terrorist attacks, the things that we think are a persistent part of our reality is far less likely to happen to us than us slipping in the in the shower. We're having a medical error which might actually cause an unfavorable outcome in our in our health or our life actually. What you're saying is a good counterbalance to the extremes that we really get in the in the media. So really, really well put. Thank you for sharing that. Another question that I have is actually related to biases. What are some of the biases that we have that are sort of with us on a, a fairly consistent basis? One of the biases that is a direct result of that categorization mm-hmm. inclination that I mentioned earlier is the in-group out-group bias. I think most people are already aware of this. You prefer members of your in-group, in-group being people you think of like you, but I don't know if most people know how deep that runs and, and hmm. how far that goes and, and how much it influences us. It is probably a, something that humans have developed since the days when we lived in small tribes. And in my opinion, not something that we're going to be able to erase. Everybody does it, whether you think you do or not. Absolutely everybody does it. It's actually a little bit more dangerous, I think, when people don't recognize that they're doing it. But it's not just a matter of liking people more or less. It extends further than that. One of the things that I've encountered that I find unfortunate but true about about humans is that when it comes to in-groups and out-groups, we distribute our empathy a lot differently, right? So Mm. we find it much easier to be empathetic to folks within our in-group. We find it a lot more difficult to extend empathy to people outside of what we consider our in-group. Now, there is hope because the one thing that could be brought to bear is the fact that those boundaries, like who's in your in-group and who's in your out-group, depends on how you're thinking of yourself at any one point in time. So if you imagine uh, someone like me, American, 45-year-old woman, have a couple kids, I don't have a lot in common with say someone in Yemen. <laughs> to imagine anything I have, like in what way could they be in my in-group? That's tough, but if you look deeper, there may be a way. And so, you know, there are Yemen women, there are mothers, there may be mothers who are 45. I mean, you're not going to find uh, someone over there who's exactly like me, but if you were to tell me a story about a woman in Yemen with two boys, because I have two boys, and some kind of struggle she was having with those boys or, you know, trying to keep them safe or, you know, something like that, well, you might kind of shift those in-group, out-group boundaries temporarily because now I can empathize with her, not as somebody in Yemen, but as a mother. And so if I'm thinking of that, then she's in my in-group and maybe all the non-parents, American and otherwise, are now the out-group. And so that is one way, I don't know if I'd say to counter that the in-group, out-group bias. It's not, you can't get rid of it. It's more, you have to think of ways to work with it. And I, I think that's the case for a lot of our human cognitive biases. They are, in some cases, 
so deeply ingrained that it is, mm -hmm. it's not useless to educate people about them because I think it is good to understand the effects that they have on our thinking. But I do think that it might be um, a stretch to imagine that people can stop having these biases, that they can just correct the bias. I, I think that a better tact is to work with them, sort of a martial arts angle on that. Instead of trying to just take a bias head on and eliminate it, consider it, understand how it works, and think about ways that you can advance better messaging, better outcomes by working with them. How do we develop biases? So that, that's an excellent question. So something like the in-group out-group bias, I think, comes directly from our categorization, which I think this is a place where research academic psychologists will disagree. You've got some folks who have this sort of tabula rasa point of view that people arrive in the world as, as a blank slate and everything is learned. There are other folks who believe that we arrive in the world with mm. minds that already work in certain ways, that we have mm. evolved over time to have minds that work in certain ways. Now, we're not going to evolve to have a prejudice against a particular group of people, but we might have evolved to have the inclination, like to be mm. like kind of preset to build prejudices, mm -hmm. you know, that, that might be how, how people evolved. And without taking a stand on whether that is something that we've evolved, or if it's something that originates, you know, during our lifetime through the experience and the environment, it does seem to be there very early. See, as I mentioned earlier, I actually started my career in studying um, infant research. And so I can tell you, but by the age of six months, babies already have visual preferences for certain kinds of people. And hmm. so that may come from their experience. They've spent six months looking at people. That's not, you know, that's not nothing. And they will see certain kinds of people more often than others. And it very well may be due to experience, but nonetheless, it's already there by six months. So wow. um, maybe wow. something about that kind of bias that either is built into us or is so core to our development that anybody around the world develops it very early on. If you want to come up with a more concrete analogy, something like walking. It's very rare a person doesn't learn to walk. If somebody doesn't learn to walk, something has gone uh, wrong in development, and you might say the same thing that, you, for example, you cannot learn to speak if you can't categorize categorization mm -hmm. has to come first. And so it may be that things like, you know, a racial prejudice is an undesired byproduct of the fact that we rely on categorization, but categorization mm -hmm. is absolutely essential. We wouldn't be able to, to think if we couldn't do that. What role does emotion play in persuasion and influence? That's an excellent question that I don't like the answer to. <laughs> um, so the answer is that I believe emotion is primary in influence and persuasion and yeah. non-emotional, rational mm -hmm. cognition is, it's in the mix, but it is not the primary way people are persuaded. The, the reason I don't like that <laughs> is that I am a cognitive psychologist, so I chose a course of study that explicitly cut off emotion. It kind of put emotion over there in that box. And I focused on the, the non-emotional parts of thinking, you know, reasoning, language development, and allocation of attention, things like that. Mm -hmm. Things that at that point in my career, I thought could be split off from emotion and emotion could go over there to those other folks to study. Mm -hmm. um, I have since then changed my mind about that. And I believe that emotion is integral to all parts of thinking. You, you can't really pull it apart, mm -hmm. despite the fact that that may be the way that textbooks are written, but it doesn't work that way in the wild, in actual <laughs> acting thinking people. And in many cases, I'd say more often than not, we arrive at our opinions and beliefs via emotion, and then we bring the, the reason in as a justification. It tends to more often be the way that we're explaining to ourselves why we feel a certain way. It's not so much the true reason we feel that way, it's, it's kind of the little layer on top that we use to explain it to ourselves and to other people. Now, that's not to say reasoning is never involved. It is. But in order to convince somebody of something through reason, through non-emotional, factual argument, you have to have several things. First of all, you have to have an audience that cares about the topic. And you have to have an audience that cares about the topic because thinking at that level takes some effort. Mm -hmm. And so they have to not only care about the topic, they then also have to have the cognitive space and capability 
to dedicate to that thought. And so that means they have to have the attentional capacity. They have to have the cognitive reasoning capacity to match the kind of arguments that you're giving them. And they have to be invested in it. And they have to be at least somewhat competent in critical thinking. Think about all that. That's a high bar. If you're having a conversation with me about, you know, an issue I care about, it could be personal. It could be, you know, should I should I take this mortgage? And, you know, thinking through the pros and cons of that. Or it could be something more academic. Like, is this a theory I believe in? I can engage in that level of thinking. Mm-hmm. But there are other topics where I, I just won't. Like, if you're trying to, frankly, sports. I'm not a sports person. So anything involving sports, if you're going to come to me with all the, the thoughts and the reasons and the data, I'm unlikely that I'm going to hang in for that. I'm just, and you know, that's me. And you know, just go back to that, that grocery store example, you're not going to do that. You're not going to sit and study every label on every cereal box and think about, okay, well, this one says it has fiber. Let me think about the data on fiber. I mean, you're just not going to do that. You might do it for a couple things in the grocery store. People will do it for a lot of things in the grocery store, but a lot of people won't do it at all. And these may be people that care very much about something else. They just don't care about fiber. And so the times when you can get people to that level of attention and that level of cognitive engagement, that's fantastic. And then you do have a very good chance of getting some really solid, probably fairly permanent persuasion. But the Mm. thing is that that's not usually the case. Usually you've got people scrolling over their device, looking at little headlines for a second or two, if you're lucky. You've got people listening to something is on the radio in the background while they're talking to somebody else. It's not the case that most persuasion is happening in that high engagement arena. So when it's not, that's when emotion becomes really primary. And that's where you're attending to things like how persuasive does the speaker sound? Not in terms of they're making good points, but in Mm -hmm. terms of how articulate they are. Um, Mm. Do do you like how they sound? Is their accent annoying? All of those things come into play. And then at a deeper emotional level, things like, is what they're saying making you feel good or not? Mm -hmm. So if somebody's challenging you, Usually it doesn't feel good. And if you're not in a deep cognitive processing mode, if you're in an emotion mode, somebody's challenging something you think, you don't like it. It doesn't feel good. So you don't believe them. And in the opposite vein, if they're saying something that makes you feel good, maybe it sort of vindicates you. It makes you feel less guilty about something. It makes you feel like good because, oh, that that confirms what I thought. Yeah, I thought I was right. Mm -hmm. Then that feels good and you like that, and you want to hear more of it. And so that's where most of us are most of the time. Just a moment ago, you were talking about how we scroll through our devices, one to two seconds, reading headlines, one to two seconds if we're lucky. A lot of misinformation and and even disinformation comes through those channels. Is there a part of our brain that buys into fake news? Well, yes and no. There is an inclination on our part to buy into news that fits what we want to think and feel about ourselves. It doesn't necessarily mean it's fake news. Real news will do the same thing. But the catch is that fake news has an advantage over real news because it can be specially designed to fit exactly what particular audiences want to hear. I mean, we can take the pandemic right now as an example. If, If you look at real true information that comes from scientists about the pandemic, it doesn't really exactly fit what anybody wants to hear. Like, when's the vaccine coming out? We're not sure. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe it's spring, but we don't know for sure. And, you know, there's all these complex questions and these tests yeah. have to be done. And then we don't know who will get it. I mean, it's a complicated answer. That doesn't make anybody feel good. It right. makes you feel good. It'll be out in a month. Great. I like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you're developing fake news, you have a big advantage over real news because you can make it exactly what people want to hear. You can make it fit what people think already, so you can Mm -hmm. reinforce their existing beliefs. If you know that they have a suspicion, like if you're trying to get them to dislike somebody else and you know they have a little hint of a suspicion there, you can just give them exactly what would pull, you know, pull that suspicion up and um, reinforce it. And the real news, the truth is just not ever that simple. So a a bunch of complicated, well, maybe this or maybe that, but you have to consider this. And that, you know, that's, that's what real news really is most of the time. And that doesn't fit. It doesn't hit the emotional button. It doesn't hit the, the notion of feeling clear and easy. It's, 
sounds like, oh, I'm going to have to really think about this if I want to understand it. And I don't feel like it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I don't pay as much attention to it. I mean, fake news can be so fast and easy and hit every single button. And that's what makes it effective. It's, it's not that there's anything about our brains that prefers fake news to real news. Our, it's just news. To your brain, information is information. It doesn't know which is real or not. It's the match. And if, if there is true news that fits exactly what a population would like to hear, then it would work as, I think, it would work as good as, as fake news. It just doesn't happen nearly as often. What role does memory play in persuasion and influence? One of the things that we've learned about memory is that it is not some indelible record in your mind. We have this idea that an event happens and we create a memory of it and then it gets filed away. And when you want to think about it again, you pull it out and you look at it. I think most people who study memory would say that that isn't really what happens. You actually recreate the memory every time you think about it. So you are constantly rewriting your own memory. We know that memories change over time. We are not particularly good judges of the accuracy of our own memories. We also know that they tend to they change in predictable ways. They don't just they don't change randomly. They change in ways that conform to your schemas, your pre-existing beliefs about things. There was a lot of research, and it's still ongoing, but there was a lot of research in the 80s and 90s on the phenomena of false memory and repressed memory. So there was um, concern that there may be memories that people have repressed and, and in fact, that does happen. It may not happen as frequently as, as some people had thought originally, but it, it does happen. You know, this led to, well, if somebody spontaneously remembers something, how do we know if it was a, a real memory that had been repressed mm. or if it's a, a false memory? You know, people worked for that on uh, a long time trying to figure out how can you tell the difference? Well, it turns out there is no difference. A, a memory in your mind is the same. It's a memory, regardless of whether it came from a true event or not. So... Again, same as before with, uh, it's almost like your brain has created its own fake news, in a sense, these, these false memories. They are indistinguishable fr from a real one, at least so far. I don't I, I don't believe anybody's come up with any good ways to reliably distinguish them yet. Yeah. Now, the way that they change is that they morph into ways to fit with what you already think. So a typical example is something you might do to your, your intro psych class to mm -hmm. pull one over on them on the first day and get their attention. If you tell a story about um, a fire, and there's a, a lot of stuff in the story, but one of the elements of the story is there's a firefighter. And then later on, maybe the next class, at some point in time in the future, you ask some questions about the story. And you never said fireman. You never said it was a man or a woman. Most people, will rem they won't just infer it was a man. They will remember it. They will tell you, you said fireman. Or maybe you even said his name was Mark or, you know, something. They'll say specific things. They have memories of you telling them in some explicit way that it was a man. And you didn't. And you know you didn't. And not every student will do that in a class, but it's very rare to have somebody falsely remember it was a female. So it, lots of people will not will remember that you didn't say, that's fine. Some people will mistakenly remember it was a man. Nobody will remember it was a woman because that is not a typical schema that people have for firefighters. So mm -hmm. you don't fill it in randomly. You fill it in with things that fit what you already think. So mm -hmm. if you think about things in the news cycle and nowadays, so if you hear a story about a particular politician or a particular event and there are some details that are either left out they're unknown or maybe you truly for they, they were in there but you forget them and you fill them back in you don't fill them in randomly you fill them in with what you think makes sense given the context so mm -hmm. if, an, uh, if a staunch republican and a staunch democrat hear the same story and, and there's some gaps they're not they'll fill those gaps in in the same way yeah. and they're both gonna really remember like really feel like they remembered the, um, the specific facts that they in fact have filled in everybody does this it's pervasive most of the time when you're doing this it's about really innocuous things so you have no idea you know do you remember every detail of your commute in the morning no do you fill it in with something that happened on the commute you know last week instead probably it doesn't matter you're never going to know it doesn't affect anything but it does affect things and this means that you remember politicians saying things they didn't say because that's what you would have expected them to say you've mentioned schemas a couple of times for our audience what is the basic definition of a schema. 
a schema is a, a mental framework. Maybe a better way to think of it would be like a script. And, and this could apply to anything. A standard one you're, when you're learning about this in psych classes, um, going to a restaurant. In the US, you have a basic script for what happens when you go to a restaurant, at least in non-pandemic times. Let's say right. so our scripts have changed. The normal script pre-pandemic to go to a restaurant is, is you go in the front door, there's somebody near the door that offers you a menu, asks, you know, takes you to a table, you sit, you look at the menu, you order food from a waiter or a waitress, the food arrives, you eat it, a bill comes, you pay it, you leave. Now, I didn't give you every step, right? Like I didn't mention that you have silverware on the table, but you know all of that. And in fact, I didn't have to tell you the details of that script. If I just said going to a restaurant, you have all of that stuff. It, it's all part of the package. And of course, there are variations. There are some restaurants where maybe the menu's already on the table. There are some restaurants where you go order at a counter and then you sit down. I mean, so the, you know, there's variations. And maybe people have a fast food script and a fancy restaurant script. But you, you will fill in memory gaps with things that fit the script, things that fit the schema. You will act as though everything in the schema, it's the default. When things really don't fit the schema, you can get kind of confused and know, not know what to do. So sometimes, I mean, this happened to me when I was a young adult and the first time I went to Europe and they don't bring you the bill in a lot of places until you ask. Whereas in the US, the bill usually shows up. So this is a part of the schema that's different. So there I am wondering where the heck is my bill, getting annoyed, thinking that you know my the wait staff was, was really lacking when in fact they were probably someplace thinking, why the heck won't this woman ask for her bill? What is, right. How long is she going to stay here? Yeah. So when you obviously action scripts, you know, things can go awry. But we, we have those schemas for absolutely everything. You have schemas, not just for events, but you have schemas for, you know, I mentioned political parties. If I see somebody as a Democrat, you've got a whole schema for that. You already know what you think they feel about abortion, gun control. I can name off a whole list of things, welfare, tax reform, free trade, you know, I can lay, you know, you have, now you might be wrong for any individual person. And you, you know, you may acknowledge that, but you have the picture. Picture. You have what you think, you know, if I say Republican, you have the picture. If I say Libertarian, you have the picture. So those are the schemas. And we will remember things that, again, fill in, fit the schemas. And when we encounter cases that don't fit our schema, it takes some time to change a schema. So, it, you know, this is another place where those categories matter. Mm. Because if I categorize somebody as outgroup, maybe I categorize them as dangerous. Maybe for some people, especially after 9-11, all of a sudden seeing an Arab looking person pulled up terrorist schema. And, you know, mm. the person's not a terrorist, the person's just a regular everyday American. But that was a schema that was highlighted in other people. And a whole lot of baggage comes in that schema. And so that explains a lot of the qualities that we attribute to other people when we don't really know that much about them. And changing a schema is possible, but it doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time. Usually you have to encounter something that violates the schema many, many times. It needs to be repeated over a long period of time, and it has to have enough variety that you can't just explain it away as the single exception. I think that that was something that happened over decades with the movement that the majority of Americans have made and how they feel about gay people. 50s and 60s, 70s even, people had a schema about gay people that was pretty negative. And they may have, you know, one friend, but that would just be the one exception. They could kind of put that person like aside and say, okay, well, that, that one person is an exception, but their schema would still stand. It took many, many years of seeing more and more people come out. So now you no longer just can make it just the one exception because you start to see more people you know personally, more public figures, um, more characters and shows, and those characters all being different from one another, right? It wasn't like they were just always all the same. You know, you had some of them as, as villains and some of them as heroes and some as next door neighbors. And it took a lot of repetition of that kind of variety to really start to move the needle on how people's schemas or that group of people changed over time. Um, and of course, it's not as though we're there yet. This is still something that's evolving. But I think most people would acknowledge there has been a big difference. Although the court cases and the legalization of gay marriage and gay rights happened pretty quickly in a, in a fairly short number of years, that was the culmination of decades of change in people's thoughts and feelings around that. 
that issue. What is psychological identity and how does that factor into persuasion and influence? Your identity is your notion of, of who you are and how you fit into the world. It is all the ways that you think of yourself in terms of, I mentioned this earlier, for me, you know, I, I can think of myself as a woman. I can think of myself as a scientist, as a resident of Virginia, but actually a Californian at heart. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that, right. that I think about myself. And everybody's got this very multifaceted package of, of ways that they think about themselves. Which group you feel is your in-group? can actually be in flux depending on which part of your identity is most salient to you at any one given point in time. So are you, when you're hanging out with a group of friends that you went to college with, you feel different in some way. If you were like a big football school, like my, my husband's college buddies, they all went to Ohio State. So when they get together, they are Buckeyes. <laughs> you right. know, and that's that's an right. identity. I mean, that, that's, that's an important thing for them. They all have in common, and that is certainly highlighted for them when they're together. And that's not, like, I don't think he's thinking much about that at work. So... It's something that very much changes in terms of what is most top of mind. And that's how we are as most Americans. That difference between the different ways that you can think about yourself is actually even greater, probably for most people in the world. So if you've ever heard about the notion of individualism versus collectivism, the idea that in some places in the world, it's more important to think of your role in a community or in a larger group within your society, maybe in your family, but that is actually your primary identity is not so much as an individual, as it is as part of a group. As Americans, among the various cultures around the planet, we are the least collectivist. You know, And even inside the US, there are some groups in the US that are more and less collectivist than others. But in general, the American way of thinking is pretty individualistic. We tend to think of ourselves first. <laughs> we prioritize ourselves first. And we think of pretty small units in terms of our identities. So everything I just mentioned about the different ways that we think of ourselves in different circumstances is even greater for those collectivist groups. Because for an American, even when you're thinking of yourself, you know, as a Buckeye or as a scientist or, you know, the various things, you're still you, there's still a core you that's yeah. there. And that core individual persona is weaker it's less salient in more collectivist cultures and the groups group identities are stronger for them than they are for us that's important when you're thinking about how you're communicating to people the kinds of messages that you want to deliver and this is where there's a big disconnect between how we message out and how other people receive the messages when we message out and we're trying to promote a person's own individual sort of self-preservation, that is likely not to resonate the way that we expect it to. It may be irrelevant. It may be even come across as offensive. Almost like, what are you asking me to ditch my, my group? That's horrible. I wouldn't do that. Why would you think I would do that? That's one of those disconnects that I sometimes get concerned about when I see how we're messaging people. Yeah. There was an example of this I, I saw in working with some State Department folks where in promoting study abroad, trying to get other students from around the world to come to the U.S. to study abroad. If you're messaging to other fairly individualistic cultures, like say Australia or Western Europe, it makes a lot of sense to promote the benefit fits to the individual. Mm -hmm. So the students right. are going to get here, they're going to have all these fantastic experiences, they're going to learn so much, they'll make lifelong friendships. That does not play as well in a highly collectivist culture where that comes across as though you're basically asking the student to abandon their home, wow. abandon their wow. family, abandon everything that's important to them. Like, forget about home. You're going to come here. You're going to love it. You're stuff and so a much more effective kind of messaging to a student in a, and also bear in mind you know I, I didn't even say this part that is assuming that the student is the one making the decision which is also less likely to be true in a collectivist society that's a family decision that's not a student decision that's a family decision and so you need to explain why it's good for the family or why it's good for the community. And so if you want to get somebody from, you know, the Philippines or, you know, someplace like that, you've got to emphasize that you're going to develop job skills that help you go home and earn more money for your family. 
you're going to learn English, and that's going to you can take you can go home and teach English to your village. That's the kind of stuff that's attractive to them. Showing pictures of a student gallivanting around the Grand Canyon is not effective. That strikes them as extremely selfish. <laughs> and so you know that that's the this is just one of a zillion examples of how we message poorly if we don't understand what's important to the people we're messaging to. And that particular one, it has a lot to do with identity. Are you thinking of yourself as an individual or, or as part of a larger group? One of the things that I've heard you speak on is the role of morals or values or even sacred values in terms of persuasion and influence. Tell us a little bit about that. There is a wealth of research now on the importance of the moral content and the sacred values underlying the messages that people hear. Now, depending on what theory you're talking about, some people will use the term sacred values and call it moral foundations. And, and there are some nuances that are different, but the core idea is that everybody has some values that are so core that to violate them is very emotionally upsetting and disturbing. And that is universal. What's not universal is what those are. <laughs> those those mm -hmm. can vary dramatically. When you talk to people about a sacred value that they hold, it is so core to them, it's even hard for them to wrap their minds around the fact that that isn't a universal value. And so this comes across, and I hate having to give this example, but it is to me the most reliable way to hit a sacred value, at least in an American population. Most Americans have a sacred value around protecting children and specifically around not engaging in sexual activity of any kind involving children, you know, so against pedophilia, basically. And that's like when I talk about this, I don't even like, I even put up more explicit stuff in the class because I want people to be like, oh, and, and by the way, for the podcast listeners, I don't mean explicit. That came, that came across badly, not like a picture or something, but just a statement of endorsing. And people grimace. People get a bad look on their face. I don't even like saying it. Like, it gives me an awful idea to even bring up this topic. And that's, I mean, you probably see it on my face right now. And that's how you know that you've hit a sacred value because people feel anger and disgust and disgust in particular, you know, back to that conversation earlier about the emotion versus reason. There's no reason here. I mean, this is a very big case of where you may so apply some reason on top of it, but your reaction is emotional. Your reaction is mm -hmm. gross, ew, right. awful, wrong, bad. And to poke it even further, I can do things like, and you know, you'll, they'll do this in labs, ask you things like, well, how much money would I have to give you to get you to change your mind? And if, mm -hmm. if we're talking about a value that is not such a deeply held sacred value, you may give me a number. <laughs> or you may say, no, I, I mean, I really feel strongly about that. I don't think I don't think you'd be able to change my mind. That's not what people say about pedophilia. Mm. You tell people, how much money do I have to give you to change your mind about pedophilia? They're like, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm not, not why would you ask me that? Right, <laughs> you right. know, that, that's not even on the table. <laughs> and, and now on top of it, I don't like you. <laughs> because yeah, why? Yeah wrong with you for even offering something like that so that's that's just a completely different level of reaction than just a issue that we disagree about right and another thing that that happens as i mentioned is often when i say this in classes where people don't have a knowledge about um some other cultures in the world and they'll say but everybody thinks that isn't that like inborn and it's not and i, I hate to tell people if, if they don't know this already but there are absolutely are cultures in the world or that is not a, a commonly held sacred value. And that is really hard for us to wrap our heads around. And if you want another example, I might say honor killing, you know, could, could maybe fall in this, this category. So, you know, for most Americans, regardless of how upset you got with your child, you would lay down your life for them. Like you would do anything to protect your kid. And the idea of killing your own child is so far outside of any, no justification for that, no matter what. Absolutely. And yet there are many, many people in the world who find that a completely legitimate thing to do. And why is that? Because they have a different sacred value. They have a sacred value attached to honor that we don't have. And they don't get it when they think about us. <laughs> when they imagine one of our daughters doing something like that and then we don't do anything about it, they may be having the same feelings of disgust. They may mm -hmm. be having that same really dramatic gut reaction of how, 
how could you tolerate that? And we can't get our head around their point of view and, and they can't get their head around ours. These are extreme examples, but you know, to make the point that that's where we go. And, and it turns out that if you look at what's happening in the brain, when people are engaged in this kind of thinking, you actually find there are differences. There are, there are different networks in the brain that are active when you're talking about things that are important to you, but not held at that level. So for me, that might be something like recycling. I care about recycling. I care about the environment. I make a good effort at it. But if, if I see somebody litter, I, I don't put them on the same level as hedophilia, right? I mean, it's here about it, but I'm not there about it. And so um, if you put me in a, in a MRI and you ask me questions around these two topics, you would find that in talking about recycling and, and climate change and things like that, the parts of my brain that are active, there's some emotional activity, but there's also some activity related to decision making and rational reasoning, some frontal lobe stuff going on there, some, some thought. But if you put me in the scanner and you start asking me these sacred value questions like about honor killing or you know um, pedophilia, the, <laughs> the thinking parts of the brain actually become less active. Active. And the emotion networks are more active. And so what this is telling us is, again, that these, you know, these values are really emotion driven, mm -hmm. your reactions are emotional, decisions you make around these topics are going to be emotional, not to say you can't apply some reasoning to them, but it's kind of like the icing on the cake, it's not the cake, the cake is the emotion. And that has pretty important implications for how to deal with these kinds of values when you're trying to convince people of things. If you, you cannot explain to somebody in a rational way why honor killing is good or bad. You will not convince anybody of anything that way. There's just no way. And I mean, you think about it, Mark, like, what kind of explanation would I have to give you to get you to come around to the whole idea of honor killing? Right? I mean, I can't. <laughs> it's just, I don't it's know. Not, right? Yeah, there's no way. I mean, I know you have kids. I don't. I don't know if you have a daughter, but two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, you yeah. can't. No, yeah. Absolutely not. Right. And um, great. And so to point out that if you're trying to influence people, you're trying to persuade them, you, you better know if you're trying to change a sacred value <laughs> because mm -hmm. you know that, that's gonna have pretty important implications for how you go about it. I wonder if in the US right now, there are sacred values at play in the really entrenched longstanding debates that we've got going on. A gun control would be one. Right. You know, when I look at that, I see sacred value of personal liberty butting up against the sacred value of um, caring for safety of people. And neither of those is a bad value, right? But right. this is a case where, and I think we've seen this, it doesn't matter how many stats you give people, that is not what their opinion is based on. It's right. just not. And so there are in fact good cases to be made reasonably on, on either side, but that's that's just not the point. Say the same thing for the, the anti-vaccination movement, you could say the same thing for pro-life versus pro-choice, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Definitely. When you look at the political discourse, you're going to see a lot of stuff about how many women are impacted and deaths from illegal abortion. You, you know, but that's that's just not why anyone feels the way they do. It's not because of some data. I shouldn't say nobody. There may be some people, but I, I would be willing to bet that a lot of people are in the sacred value realm on those particular issues, and it's not a matter of convincing them with reason and data. Do you have any examples or case studies that stand out to you? as being highly effective persuasion and influence campaigns? The anti-smoking campaign, I think, would be a, a good example in the U.S. And I think it's an important one to learn from for, for a lot of reasons. Probably the first thing to think about is how long <laughs> it's been going. I believe the big landmark lawsuits, I think, started, I want to say, in the 80s. When I was a kid in the 80s, you could still get cigarettes from those little machines in restaurants, you yeah. could, yep. the restaurants still had smoking section, non-smoking section. Mm -hmm. It was very different. And now, you know, of course, completely different situation now, but that's 40 years, you know? So I think one thing that people sometimes don't realize is to have really sticky, persistent change is not gonna happen from one campaign that you put out for a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ones that we've seen that have worked well have come from all different messengers, all different venues, and have been really persistent over at least years, you know, at least years, if not, I mean, we're talking decades. So that's one thing to think about. And then another thing to think about is all the different ways 
that people tried to change smoking behavior. Now, is, is smoking a sacred value? Probably not for most smokers. It conceivably might touch on some for some people, though. Some people might have a, a notion of, uh, well, remember the, I don't know, but the Marlboro Man? He was sort of the emblem of, of a particular brand, but it, he got bigger than that. He kind of became the emblem of smoking. Mm -hmm. And more than that, there was a lot attached to him about identity. He was a cowboy for one thing, and if right. there's anything that epitomizes the rugged individualism that Americans love, it's a cowboy. And he was like the strong, silent type, super masculine, super individualistic. And if that's how you want to think about yourself, you buy into that. And part of that is nobody else is going to can tell me what to do and tell me I can smoke or not smoke and so right. that really kind of built into this sense so it may even if just smoking in and of itself is you know not likely to be sacred value if it becomes incorporated into this piece of your identity it becomes part of the value of self-determination and freedom mm -hmm. and becomes part of your identity that's strong and again this is where if that's the level that you're at, giving people data, <laughs> I mean, they right. may not even leave your data, right? Because if right. they've got a schema set up, and remember, of course, everybody's got the like, well, I know so-and-so who smoked and lived till he was 109, you know, so we, yeah. you've built a schema around that, and the data's coming in, you're going to, you're not going to think it's true, or you're going to forget parts of it, or you're going to find ways to discount it. In that case, it wasn't a you know, there there might be, there certainly were some people that the data mattered, but there are probably also people that it wasn't about giving them data. It was about destroying the Marlboro Man. It was about wow. picking him apart. And it was about, and if you think about the campaigns that came out, some were data driven, but a lot of them were much more emotional and were meant to give a picture of a smoker that countered the Marlboro Man. So one that a lot of people might remember is the woman with the hole in her neck talking. And oh, she's, yeah. Very, I mean, she looked so sick. There was a series of campaigns linking, I and mean, this is a direct attack on old Marlboro Man, linking sexual impotence to smoking. They <laughs> showed men with cigarettes and the cigarettes would wilt. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's going after the link between smoking and masculinity. That was what had to happen. Some people smoke because they're addicted. And that's a completely, that's a medical thing that we can develop, you know, patches and all that for. But for the people that are, they don't even want to quit. The people that want to smoke, why? <laughs> and how, mm. how do you just, how do you get at that? Well, if they want to smoke because they think it's this individualistic, awesome, you know, piece of their identity, that's what you have to get at. Mm. And so that was that one was effective. And then the other one that was very effective was um, specifically targeted at youth as part of the truth campaign. And this is one of the more recent ones. In that part of the campaign, they were talking specifically to younger people and characterizing the tobacco industry. So now we're, we're away from the Marlboro man. I think he's kind of been ruined. And now we've got the notion that there's these bad guys, the tobacco industry and they are coming for you they just want your money mm. and they'll kill you to get it and by making them sort of if you ever saw pictures of the people that were the face of the tobacco industry they're old white men and so they're they're basically trying to set up an us versus them with the youth being the us and the old you know the man the people that the youth already just kind of naturally don't like yeah. that's the tobacco industry and so in that case, they want the youth to feel like, I'm not going to be a sucker for these guys. And so that's taking advantage of the in-group, out-group thing. So I, that wasn't a case with the other ones I just mentioned. But for this one, it absolutely is. You're setting up an in-group, out-group. That's them. They're bad. They don't care about us. I don't trust them. And therefore, I don't trust their products. I don't trust anything they say about them. And building this really antagonistic relationship between the would-be smoker and the, the bad guys, the, the tobacco industry. So, and I think that one's been pretty effective too. And so smoking rates in the U.S. were much, much lower. You know, obviously some people still smoke. But if you've traveled at all, especially to Asia, you'll see huge differences. It's amazing. Um, now that we don't have smoking allowed in so many places, it's always a shock. Maybe go back to walking in the room. Oh my God, there's smoke. <laughs> but, right. um, yeah. So I mean, I think I think that that would be one example of, of something. But again, it took a lot of different tacks. It took a long time, and it took a deep understanding, and it took emotion-driven campaigns. Is there a way for us to test or assess in any way how influenceable we are? 
Yeah, I can think of some kinds of measures. For example, there is a, we, we talked about false memory a little while ago. Um, some people are more prone to them than others. And so people who are more prone um, to developing false memories, um, we would say that they are more suggestible. It's like a sliding scale. It's not like you are or aren't suggestible. It's, right. you know, there's more shades of gray in there. But the, the more suggestible you are, the, the easier your scripts and schemas change. And the, the more likely you are to misremember facts or not remember where a piece of information came from. Now, what I would say, caution you against though is that I'm not so sure I think that there is an element of individual difference I do think some mm -hmm. people are more suggestible than others but I think that there's also so many different variables that are affecting an individual's suggestibility at any, any one point in time I'm not sure that I would take like your suggestibility score I don't really know how much that would tell me and I'll, I'll tell you yeah. what one thing is people become more suggestible as they get older mm. so that actually yeah it's actually there there's pretty good evidence that not in the not in the earlier decades. Like there's not much of a difference between like a, a 30 year old and a 40 year old. But but in say 60 up, the older you are, the more likely you are to endorse false news. Disinformation mm -hmm. has a greater impact on older people than on younger people. Um, we don't know yet whether that's because you got old or because those people grew up in a time when the news could be trusted. That's something that honestly, we're not gonna probably know for another 30 years because we're yeah. gonna have to wait for today's you know, younger people to get old before we're able to right. test something like that. Right. Um, but I can tell you, there are other bits of evidence that suggest that older people will become more suggestible. It has to do with, um, they become less able to inhibit, and this happens to everybody, this is not a knock against older people, it's just something that happens in aging to our brains. Mm. We are less able to inhibit thought in general. This actually is related to why older people have more tip of the tongue phenomena, while they, mm. they tend to tell longer stories, it's just the nature of what happens to your brain in aging. And part of that may be that they are not able to inhibit the processing of information as though it's it's all true and real. Um, but like I said, caveat, we don't really know why yet. We just know that that is an age group that is at greater risk for disinformation effects. The other thing we don't know is um, your suggestibility is probably very related to in any given moment, how many cognitive resources you have to bring to bear on an issue. So you're more suggestible when you're tired. You're more mm, suggestible yeah. when you're upset. You're more suggestible when you're busy or when the topic is complicated and you don't have enough background on it. I mean, all of the things that make information harder to deal with will, will make you more suggestible in that particular instance. So I do think that there are individual differences, but I'm not sure how important they are. Like, I don't know if, if mm. a very suggestible person on their best day may be less suggestible than a less suggestible person on their worst day, yeah. if that makes sense. And, and right. so I think everybody is vulnerable at, at some time. How do we think critically about information that's presented to us? There's whole rubrics for, for critical thinking that involve, you know, examining, you know, where did the data come from? What kind of data are they? Um, checking your own biases. The fact of the matter is most of us can't do that all of the yeah. time. I think that there are some habits that maybe these are like counter heuristics in a sense, but just remember you know, educate yourself about those biases and just have them in mind. So, mm -hmm. you know, now that I've told you about the availability bias, maybe the next time you are listening to the news and you're hearing about this terrible thing that happened in Belgium or something, and, you know, someplace far away, and you can kind of think to yourself, well, now there's an example of a thing that is probably super rare, and yet I'm hearing mm -hmm. about it. And I wonder what other things happened today that I didn't hear about. I mean, it's not, obviously, you can do this all the time, but it's just an awareness, I think, so that it will not erase your bias. It will not correct it, but by remembering it exists, it might help you take that extra step. Mm -hmm. So if you become fearful or you know are concerned about, should I go on a trip to Belgium now? And you're thinking about that awful thing. Well, remember that the availability bias might have come into play. So now you can like, you know, hop online, look at what the State Department has to say to travel to Belgium and look at it and say, oh, actually, it looks like it's fine. And that was just the, right. this one incident that could have happened anywhere it could have happened a block over <laughs> so I'm no better off going to you know to the store than I am going to Belgium so maybe I'll take my trip not trying to combat the bias because that's not going to work <laughs> but just remind reminding yourself of it and then taking the time to learn a little bit more about it but again 
you will only be able to do this for a minority of things. And so you, you, you also will need to bear in mind that what's important and what's not have some trusted sources that you can refer to. And also I, I would remind everybody to have some grace like when other people have opinions and beliefs that you think sound ridiculous, remember that all of these biases are at play in all of us all the time. And yeah. it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean they're evil. It means that they, along the way in their life, developed a different schema than you. And all of these forces are at act in them and in you. Not to say there's not evil people out there. I, I, I think there are, but I think they're far and few between. And most people are just people doing the best they can. Yeah. And remembering that they didn't, come to this place because they're crazy or bad. They came to this place because of the same way that you came to your place. So I guess that's not so much critical thinking. It's just a, a, maybe a little bit of a call for a little bit of recognition that even as different as we seem sometimes, we're kind of all in the same boat with our brains. If you were to put together a persuasion and influence campaign of any kind, what are some of the elements that you would include in it? How would you go about doing it? The most fundamental Call it two most fundamental things. The first is before you start, you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And if you're trying to accomplish a feeling or a belief really, really hard, and you're not going to know if you succeeded. If you don't know if you succeeded, you're not going to be able to tune your approach. You're not going to know when to stop. <laughs> you're not going to you're not going to be able to track your progress and make corrections. And so I think the very first thing you have to do is understand what real world objective effect are you trying to create? So in the case of smoking, I mean, that's an easy one. You could track cigarette sales. <laughs> you know, that that's an easy one. Um, in a lot of cases, we're not looking at things that, that are that easy if we're trying to, you know, reduce animosity towards ethnic minorities in Europe or something. That's a, that's a little harder. So you, you need to put real thought into what does that mean? Am I tracking hate crimes? Am I going to do periodic surveys of people? You need to figure out a very concrete way to know if your efforts are working or not. Because if you don't have that, all the rest of the stuff you do, who knows if it's working? You don't know. So that would be the first step. Now, imagine you've achieved that. I think the next thing then is to understand your, your starting point. Now, some of that is just baseline data about, you know, current cigarette sales and current surveys about feelings toward ethnic minorities. But more importantly, I'd want to understand why the, the group that you want to influence is behaving the way that they are. So we talked about that a minute ago with smoking. Why do people smoke? Some people would like to stop and they can't. Okay, so that's one group. Some people smoke because all their friends smoke. Okay, that's another group. Some people, it's an important part of their identity. They got this like Marvel Managing Steam thing going on. Okay, that's a group. And you've got to understand the why, why they're engaging in that behavior. Because if you've got the, the Marlboro Man crowd and you're talking to them about health risks or about being a sheep that conform, in fact, that one might even backfire, right? If, you're if you think that they're smoking because everybody else is smoking, but they're actually smoking to be an individual and you're trying to tell them, don't be a sheep, they may very well say, no, no, I'm not a sheep. That's why I smoke, you know? So you you have to really understand the underlying motivations of the group yeah. so that you understand what kind, of a, what kind of a message might be persuasive. Another example right now in the US is in the anti-vaccination movement, pro-vaccination people all have a pretty similar reason for promoting vaccination. They believe that it is in the best interest and health of children and, and the community at large. And so that's the message that they put out there to anti-vaccination people, that this promotes health. And so part of the, in the earlier years, part of that conversation was around trying to get a point across that vaccines don't cause autism. They don't. I mean, it's it's been the little bits of research that even hinted at that have been completely debunked. There is zero evidence that vaccination causes autism. And so that's what the pro-vaccination movement piled onto and proved that again and again. And it may be that there were some anti-vax people that came around, but there's a whole bunch who didn't. And if you examine them, it turns out that for a lot of them, it has nothing to do with autism. It has to do with them feeling that requiring vaccinations is overreach of government. So if you've got somebody that thinks vaccinations are, you know, a sign of an authoritarian government, you're talking to them about autism. And so that's just another case where you have to understand what is the core belief? What is the reason why that group holds the belief they do? And then you have to create messaging 
that, that goes there. And then the next thing, and it all tied into that is understanding the identity. And then I, I would also suggest that the messaging that you create certainly can include rational, critical thinking based debate, but it had better also include emotion. If you neglect the emotion, you're going to leave behind a big part of the audience. And there may be some campaigns where, you know, you know the, the mix will vary. You know, depending on the topic, but if you're imagining that you're going to go in and make big changes just based on um, some wonky explanation, I I, I doubt it. (laughs) I doubt it in most cases. So I want to get out of the the realm of of expertise, and I actually want to ask you some some more general and advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? Um, (laughs) That's a hard one. Um, Well, I call it perseverance. Some people who know me might call it stubbornness. (laughs) It depends on on who you ask, but I I do tend to get perversely more motivated the more difficult something is. Um, Mm. This has attracted me, I think, to to a lot of the work that I do with DERPA, the defense organization that is specifically tasked with doing the most moonshot, difficult research out there. Awesome. DARPA is made to do the research that any other organization would think was like that'll never work. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, and I love that. (laughs) I love that notion of like, that. you know, this is the stuff that other people think we're a little bit crazy trying to do. And so, um, good. Yeah. The harder it is, the more excited I get about it. Um, which I think just two things. One, it keeps me on the problem until I, until I make some progress, but two, it also puts me in a space where a lot of people, you know, a self-selected group a lot of the people already got scared off so i don't have as much competition (laughs) i get that i get that what is the greatest lesson that you've learned either in life or in business i think this applies both to the work that i do as as well as life role of emotion you know, so, so I already mentioned it in terms of its role in persuasion, but I think in, you know, there are probably people in the world that, that have this revelation much earlier than me, but I think among scientists, <laughs> you know, I spend my time around other scientists and data scientists, computer yeah. scientists, and as a group, we, we are very data driven and we want facts. And you've seen this happening in the political world in the last 10 years. Facts are really important, but they are not the end-all be-all. They're not enough. If you're not paying attention to how people feel, you're going to miss a lot. There's a a Maya Angelou quote, I think it is, and she says something like, you know, people will forget what you said, and they'll forget what you did, but they won't forget the way you made them feel. So and true. I, yeah. And, and in a very, you know, much more operational twist on that, when I'm telling people my thoughts on countering disinformation, you know, I'll tell them another version of that is if you correct the fact, but you've left the, the bad feeling that goes along with it, <laughs> that doesn't do any good. And right. so right. on the other hand, if you make people feel good, you don't have to worry about the incorrect fact. It loses its impact. And I think that that place for emotion is, is something that it's taken me a while to, to come around to. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. Go to the beach, relax. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good. No, I think maybe reaching back to what I what I mentioned a little earlier, but just trying to remember, you know, everybody is a person, <laughs> and everybody you know, has these these same biases, we are all struggling with them, whether we know it or not, all of the time. And, you know, some people think I'm too optimistic in this way, but I really do think that most people are good at heart. And I don't think that people that disagree with me vehemently are bad people. I think they just have different ideas, different biases, different schemas, and it can be really challenging. And I have to remind myself of that myself when I'm wanting to scream about, you know, some something that they're endorsing. But these things, they did not come out of the blue. There is a reason. There is something about the way those things make them feel that is important to them. And if they could feel good without holding on to those things, you know, then they wouldn't need them, but they can't. And, and that's, that's why they hold on to them. And, and everybody's got these things that they probably hold on to for the same reason. What do you want most for your life? I want to feel by the end, whenever that might be, that I left a little something behind to help the greater good. And, and in my particular case, I think it's 
likely to be a little bit more scientific understanding. What it is I leave is, is less important than that notion that, that something I did added to the good of humanity in, in some way. And it sounds really grand. It kind of sounds a little odd when I say it out loud like that. But I, I have a former collaborator who, who recently passed away and he did phenomenal work. His name was Emile Brunel. And he was the Annenberg School of Communication at UPenn. And he was also with a group called Beyond Conflict. And he did amazing work specifically in the areas of neuroscience and looking at empathy and the role of dehumanization in intergroup conflict. And you know, he was actively applying this to things like helping Roma children in Eastern Europe who were being terrorized at their schools. I mean, he was, he was very active that way. And when he got a diagnosis of terminal brain cancer, his response was not to go into seclusion. His response was to go faster and to push wow. his research as far and as hard as he could and with an emphasis on lining up the people in his research network that he thought were going to be the ones to carry it forward. I, I literally learned of his death while I was sitting with a research paper on my lap about um, some of the latest dehumanization, um, natural language processing technology. And, you know, I thought to myself, he did make that difference like he did leave something really important behind and touched a lot of people and ensured that they could carry it going forward and so if if i could feel like i had done the same that he did i, I would feel like that was a success in in my heart of hearts i really do believe that you are adding to the greater good i really do where can people find you and connect with you online it's easy to find me on linkedin you know more than welcome to look me up there send me a message send me a link request and other than that, um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to take email. The email I have right now is victoria.romero at caci.com. But honestly, I think I think the LinkedIn is the most persistent one. You can always find me there. I use, I use it a lot. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. We could spend all day, or at least I could spend all day talking with you. Absolutely insightful and fascinating to talk with you, Victoria, as always. And I have a feeling that we're going to be talking again <laughs> <laughs> soon uh, about, I love uh, about some other things. Thank you so much for the time. It's been incredible talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it.